It was an ordinary shift out at Lonesome Pine Reserve, which wasn't much of a spot for tourists, and that was just fine by me. Lonesome Pine sat far off the beaten path, somewhere in the Appalachians, where time crawled slow and the silence could stretch for miles. Not many ventured there unless they were locals or hopelessly lost. The thick forests, deep ravines, and endless hollows weren't for casual hikers. I had been working as a ranger for the past eight years, Sol Baxter, that's my name. Before that, I was a firefighter in Memphis until I blew out my knee. Needed something quieter, something that wouldn't wreck my already screwed up body any further. That's how I ended up here, managing trails and occasionally helping folks who underestimated the remoteness of these woods. It had been a strange week, though. Not the normal type of odd, like finding trash left behind or some lost campers, but a bit eerie. We'd had a series of missing pets from nearby farms, a couple of goats, even a horse. There were whispers of black bears, but I had seen enough bear tracks in my time to know when one was around. This wasn't that. I was out near the southern boundary that day, close to the old logging trails no one used anymore. The sky was overcast, the air was thick, and a smell, something rotten, had been lingering on the breeze for days. I couldn't place it, but it sure wasn't natural. I radioed in my position to Avery, another ranger stationed a good 15 miles north. We kept regular check-ins since the terrain here could swallow a man whole, no questions asked. Saul, you sure you want to keep poking around there? Avery's voice crackled. Those old trails haven't been touched in years. Just making sure, I responded. Smells like something might have died out here. Maybe we missed a carcass or something. I'll do a sweep and head back. With that, I hiked deeper into the trees, where the undergrowth grew thick. The canopy above was dense enough to block out most of the light, casting long shadows across the forest floor. The smell got worse the further I went, a putrid, sour stench that made my stomach churn. I followed it, pushing through the brush until I reached a small clearing. That's when I saw it. The ground was torn up, as if something massive had been thrashing around. The earth was stained dark with blood and bits of fur, gray, coarse, and unfamiliar, were scattered across the clearing. Whatever had been here wasn't a small animal. Then I saw the remains. Not human, but close enough. It was the horse, a big mare from one of the farms, or at least what was left of it. The creature had been mauled, its ribs exposed, Entrails half-devoured and head torn clean off. Something big had done this. Something savage. I crouched down to inspect the wounds. They weren't clean like a bear or mountain lions would be. No, these were jagged, irregular. Like someone had taken a dull blade and hacked away at the flesh. But there was no blade here. Only teeth. Large, uneven, predatory teeth. I heard rustling behind me and stood, scanning the area. My hand instinctively went to the knife at my belt, my only real defense, since I wasn't carrying a gun. I didn't need one for most of my work here, but at that moment, I wished like hell I had packed one. The rustling grew louder, and I backed away from the clearing. Something was moving through the trees, heavy, deliberate, and it wasn't walking on two legs. Whatever it was, it broke through the brush a moment later, and I caught my first glimpse of it. A hulking mass of muscle and fur. It stood low to the ground, its back arched, moving with a strange, unsettling grace for something so large. It reminded me of a giant wolf, but bulkier, with broad shoulders and thick limbs. The creature's face wasn't fully visible at first, but then it turned slightly, and I saw enough to know I was in trouble. Its head was elongated, like a wild boar's, with tusks curling upward from its mouth. But its fur was patchy and mangy. Where there should have been eyes, there were deep, black hollows, sunken into its skull. The smell hit me then, the same rotten odor that had been in the air for days. I slowly backed up, trying not to make any sudden movements. The beast snorted, sniffing the air, and its head snapped in my direction, 
It moved faster than I expected, leaping forward, jaws snapping at where I had been standing just seconds before. I stumbled back, adrenaline pumping through my veins as I ran, ducking under low-hanging branches and dodging rocks. It chased me through the woods, its growls echoing all around me, making it impossible to tell how close it was. My knee screamed in pain with each step, but I couldn't stop. I knew if I slowed down, it'd be over. I burst through a thicket of trees and found myself at the edge of a ravine. The ground crumbled beneath my feet, and I scrambled for balance, nearly tumbling over the edge. There was nowhere else to go. I could hear the creature crashing through the brush behind me, so I made a split-second decision and slid down the embankment, hoping the creature wouldn't follow. I landed hard at the bottom, dirt and rocks skidding down around me. My knee buckled and I cursed under my breath. But then, silence. I lay there, barely breathing, waiting for the sound of claws against stone, waiting for that awful stench to flood my nostrils again. But nothing came. For a moment I thought maybe the thing had lost interest. Maybe it couldn't follow me down here. I waited a minute longer before pulling myself up on my feet, leaning heavily on a fallen branch for support. I had to get back to the station. If nothing else, I needed to warn Avery. I started limping along the ravine, trying to find a path back up when I heard something behind me. Slowly, I turned, expecting to see the creature again. But what I saw was far worse. The thing had crawled down the ravine, silently stalking me. It stood just feet away, staring at me, its mouth dripping with the blood of the horse. There was no more running. I grabbed the knife from my belt and faced it head on. If this thing wanted me, it was going to have to fight for it. I was not going down without a struggle. The creature lunged at me, but I sidestepped it, plunging my knife deep into its side as it passed. The thing howled, an ear-splitting screech that rattled through the ravine. It swung its massive head toward me again, but this time, I didn't back down. I drove the blade into its throat, twisting it as hard as I could. The beast thrashed wildly, trying to shake me off, but I held on, driving the blade deeper and deeper until I felt its body go limp. It collapsed onto the ground, and I fell with it, panting, my hands shaking uncontrollably. I stayed there for what felt like an eternity before finally mustering the strength to stand. The creature lay dead at my feet, its blood pooling around its lifeless body. It didn't disappear, didn't vanish into the night like some ghost. It was real, flesh and bone, and it was dead. I made my way back to the ranger station, where Avery found me hours later, covered in dirt and blood, but alive. The local authorities took the body, but I don't know what they'll make of it. Hell, I don't know what to make of it. All I know is that thing was real, and it's not coming back. I've always hated the smell of pine trees. Not because they smell bad. No, it's quite the opposite, actually. They're too clean, too fresh. It's a smell that gets in your head, and once it's there, it sticks like glue. I work as a park ranger in the northernmost corner of Washington, near the Canadian border. Most people haven't heard of the place where I work, just a handful of old cabins and trails that rarely see much traffic. My name is Clint Drury, and I'm here more by accident than anything. I needed a job, and this was the only thing open. So here I am, wandering the woods, cleaning up after hikers who forget that nature doesn't come with a trash can. I didn't grow up in these woods. I'm from the Midwest, a flat stretch of nothing where I learned to keep to myself. After a stint in the army, I found myself with no real direction and even fewer friends. Being a ranger sounded like it might be peaceful, a way to avoid the noise of the world. Turns out it's mostly lonely. Not peaceful, just lonely. Most days I walk the same trails, checking the same markers, making sure no one's gone and gotten themselves hurt. I might see one or two people in a week, tops. So when the missing person report came in, I figured it would be a routine search. Her name was Lauren Shingley, early 30s, according to the report. She'd been camping with her boyfriend up by Moose Creek but hadn't returned to the trailhead. The boyfriend, Rick, said they had an argument and she'd stormed off alone. That's always a great start. 
It didn't help that Rick was a jittery mess when I met him. Said she'd been gone for nearly 48 hours. Two days out here without supplies? That's a death sentence. The temperature drops fast at night. I grabbed my gear and set out early, hoping I'd find her within a few hours. Maybe huddled under some tree, mad as hell but alive. The woods were quiet that morning. No birds, no wind. Just the soft crunch of pine needles underfoot and that ever-present smell. I radioed in a couple of times with no updates, just the usual. Still nothing. Continuing search. About five hours into the search, I came across something strange. There was a clearing about half a mile from where Rick said they had camped. It wasn't on any of my maps, but that wasn't too unusual. This forest has its fair share of odd corners and forgotten places. What was unusual was the smell. Not pine, something else. Something rancid and sour, like meat left too long in the sun. I stepped into the clearing expecting to find an old deer carcass or maybe a bear's leftovers. Instead, I found something much worse. Bones. Scattered, white, and gleaming in the dappled light. But not animal bones. These were human. I recognized them immediately. Years of wilderness training and military service had taught me to recognize death up close. And these bones were fresh. My heart sank as I approached. A torn backpack lay nearby, the fabric shredded, blood dried on the straps. The bones weren't Lauren's. They were too large, too heavy. I knelt down, poking at the ground around them. No sign of clothes or shoes, just bones and the mangled remains of a backpack. That's when I heard it. A rustling sound behind me, faint but deliberate. I turned slowly, standing up and reaching for the hunting knife on my belt. It was instinctual. My rifle was slung over my back, and I didn't have time to grab it. The woods had gone dead silent again. That alone made my skin crawl. Then it stepped into view. At first I thought it was a bear. It was big enough, maybe seven feet tall, lumbering, with hunched shoulders and thick, matted fur. But then I saw its face. It was wrong. Its snout was shorter, more like that of a pit bull than a bear, with massive jaws and sharp teeth. Its legs weren't built like a bear's either, too long, too bipedal. I stood frozen for a second, trying to make sense of what I was looking at. It moved in a way that was almost unnatural, like it wasn't used to its own body. It stared at me for a moment, sniffing the air, and I could see its massive chest rise and fall. I didn't dare move. My hand tightened around the knife, but I knew it wouldn't be enough. My rifle wouldn't even be enough. This thing wasn't like anything I'd ever seen. Not a bear. Not a wolf. Something else. The creature took a step closer, its head low, and I saw its claws. Long, hooked, like those of an eagle, but thicker. It moved forward again, slowly, cautiously, as if sizing me up. I backed up a step, keeping my eyes locked on it. I could feel the sweat pouring down my back, the adrenaline kicking in. Suddenly, it lunged. Not towards me, but towards the bones. It grabbed a femur, crunching down on it like a dog with a bone. That was my chance. I bolted, sprinting through the trees as fast as I could. I didn't care where I was going, just away from that thing. My radio was dead. I must have dropped it in the clearing. I ran for what felt like an hour before I collapsed behind a fallen tree, panting, my chest burning. I knew it wasn't far behind me. The thought of those claws ripping through flesh haunted me. I don't know how long I sat there, hidden among the roots and dirt, long enough for the sun to dip lower in the sky. I kept expecting to hear it crashing through the trees after me, but the woods were quiet again. No wind, no birds, just that smell, clean pine mixed with something darker. I had to get back to the ranger station. My rifle was useless, but I had a flare gun in the cabin. Maybe I could scare it off with that. I waited until the shadows grew long before I made my move. I crawled from my hiding spot, listening for any sign of the creature. But all I heard was my own breathing. When I finally reached the station, I locked the door behind me, grabbing the flare gun and loading it. 
The thing was out there, I knew that much. I just didn't know where, or how long it would be before it decided I was worth coming after. And then, just as I was catching my breath, I heard the knock. Three sharp taps on the door. Not heavy like the creature's steps, but deliberate. I opened the door cautiously, flare gun ready. It was Rick, Lauren's boyfriend. His face was pale, his hands trembling. Did you find her? He asked, his voice barely a whisper. I didn't know what to say. I hadn't found her, but I'd found something else. Something worse. Rick stepped inside, closing the door behind him. He sat down heavily in the nearest chair, burying his face in his hands. She's out there, he muttered. I saw her. Before it. He trailed off. But I knew what he was trying to say. Whatever had happened to Lauren, it wasn't something a person could survive. I handed him the flare gun. Stay here, I said. I'll be back. Rick looked up at me, his eyes wide with fear. Where are you going? To finish this. I grabbed my hunting knife and stepped back outside, the cool night air hitting my skin. The woods were still, but I knew it was out there, waiting. The creature didn't come for me that night, or the next, but it left its mark. The bones in the clearing didn't disappear. When the search team came the next day, they found what I'd seen. Evidence of something horrible. As for Lauren, she never turned up. No body, no sign of where she might have gone. But I know, and Rick knows. And so do the bones, bleaching in the sun where we left them. There's something out there. It doesn't vanish. And it doesn't forget. I was always more comfortable in the silence of the forest than in the noise of the city. My name's Jed Larkin, and I've been a park ranger for ten years. It wasn't what I dreamed of as a kid. I wanted to be a mechanic, like my old man. But things changed after he passed away in a car accident that I somehow survived. I walked away without a scratch, and that messed with my head for a long time. Life, fate, whatever you call it, shoved me in this direction. And here I am, stationed in the forests of northern Minnesota, Gaskin Wilderness. This place doesn't get many visitors. The tourists usually stick to the state parks, and the hikers prefer the more famous trails. Gaskin is remote, thick with undergrowth and full of jagged cliffs that hide small, forgotten lakes. It's quiet here, which suits me just fine. I like having space to think, or not think at all. Today was supposed to be like any other. I had a morning patrol, checking for fallen branches blocking the trails. It was routine work, and I had a nice rhythm going. But around noon, things started to go sideways. I was headed back toward the ranger station when I noticed something off near the north trail. A large pine tree had fallen. Nothing unusual with the storms we'd been having. But this wasn't storm damage. The trunk was snapped clean about ten feet up, like a giant hand had reached down and crushed it. That's not normal. I walked closer, noticing deep gouges in the bark where the tree had broken. It wasn't the work of a bear or an elk. I'd seen plenty of that before. This looked like something had grabbed it, something with a lot more force than any animal around here should have. I bent down, running my fingers over the rough edges of the break. The wood was splintered, sharp, and fresh. Whatever did this hadn't left long ago. Jed? The voice crackled through my radio, pulling me out of my thoughts. It was Travis, another ranger stationed about ten miles south. Got some campers reporting strange noises near Copper Lake. You mind checking it out? I'm tied up with a missing person case. Yeah, I'll head that way, I replied, grabbing my map. Copper Lake was about four miles north of my position, nestled deep in a ravine with only one way in and out. Remote as hell. As I hiked toward the lake, the air felt different. Thicker, heavier. The kind of humidity that hangs in the air before something bad happens. The trees around me were still, but not in a peaceful way. It was like everything was holding its breath. The first thing I noticed when I reached the lake was the quiet. 
No birds, no wind, not even the rustle of leaves. The second thing was the smell. Something metallic mixed with the stench of decay, like a slaughterhouse left out in the sun. I followed the scent toward the shore, and that's when I saw it. The remains of what used to be a deer lay half in, half out of the water. Its body was torn open, flesh hanging in strips, organs missing. Whatever did this wasn't hunting for food, it was killing for the sake of killing. But it wasn't the deer that froze me in my tracks. No, it was the tracks around it. Huge, deep prints, like those of a wolf, but bigger, much bigger. Claws dug deep into the mud, but they didn't match anything I'd ever seen. They were more like talons, curved and sharp. I knelt by the tracks, trying to make sense of them. They were too large for any wolf in Minnesota, too wide for a bear, and the spacing was off. Almost like they belonged to something that walked on two legs, but had the weight of something much heavier. As I stood, the silence shattered. From somewhere across the lake came a sound, a long, low bellow that echoed off the cliffs. It wasn't a howl, wasn't a growl. It was something altogether different, like the sound of an alligator thrashing underwater, but wrong. Like it came from something bigger, much bigger. My heart raced as I scanned the tree line, eyes darting from shadow to shadow. But nothing moved. No sound followed the bellow no crack of branches or snap of twigs. Whatever it was had gone still again. I tried the radio. Travis, you there? Static. Travis, come in. Nothing. Great. I was alone out here, and whatever had torn apart that deer was nearby. I backed away from the lake, keeping my eyes on the shoreline as I moved. The prince led off into the dense brush, away from the main trail and deeper into the forest. Part of me wanted to follow them, but a bigger part of me, the part that wasn't an idiot, knew better. I started back toward the station, moving quickly but quietly. Every step felt heavier than the last, my boots sinking into the earth as if the ground itself was trying to swallow me. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that something just out of sight was keeping pace with me, waiting for me to let my guard down. And then I heard it, behind me, maybe fifty yards away. The sound of branches snapping, but not like something walking. More like something moving fast. I turned, but the trees blocked my view. That's when I saw it. A flash of movement between the trunks. Something dark and massive, slipping through the undergrowth with a speed that shouldn't have been possible for something that size. It was like a cross between a bear and a lizard, with a long, muscular tail that whipped around behind it, cutting through the ferns like a scythe. Its body was covered in what looked like thick, matted fur, but the tail and back had patches of rough, scaly skin, like the armor of a crocodile. I didn't stick around to get a better look. I turned and ran. I didn't stop running until I burst out onto the main road near the ranger station, breathless and soaked in sweat. My mind raced, trying to piece together what I had just seen. But nothing made sense. Nothing that big should move that fast, and nothing that vicious should be so quiet. I barged into the station and grabbed the phone, dialing Travis's number. He picked up after a few rings, his voice crackling through the line. Jed, what's going on? Travis, there's something out here, I panted. Something big, bigger than any bear or wolf. It's... it's hunting. What are you talking about? His voice sounded concerned, but skeptical. What did you see? I don't know what it was, man, I said. But it killed a deer, and it was tracking me. We need to shut down the trails. Get people out of here. There was a long pause. All right, I'll notify the higher-ups. But Jed, we can't just... The phone cut off, replaced by static. I slammed the receiver down and grabbed my rifle from the locker. If this thing was still out there, I wasn't going to be caught off guard again. I loaded the gun, checking the chamber before heading back outside. The forest was dark now, the sky above thick with clouds. I could feel the weight of the rifle in my hands, 
the cool metal grounding me as I scanned the tree line. My heart still pounded in my chest, but I wasn't going to run again. And then I saw it, standing at the edge of the trees, just beyond the range of my flashlight. It was tall, taller than a man, and hunched over like some twisted hybrid of predator and prey. The head was elongated, almost reptilian, with wide, flaring nostrils. Its shoulders were broad, covered in patches of that same thick fur, and its arms hung low, tipped with claws that gleamed in the dim light. It stared at me, just stared. Neither of us moved. My finger hovered over the trigger, and then, with a suddenness that made my heart jump, it bolted, disappearing back into the trees with a fluidity that defied its bulk. I stood there for a long moment, listening to the forest. The weight in my chest lifted, and I finally allowed myself to breathe. The others believed me when I showed them the prints, the torn-up deer carcass, and the broken tree. We closed the park for a while, citing dangerous wildlife in the area. No one went missing. No one else saw the creature. But I know it's still out there. And next time, I won't hesitate. The forest was always quiet this time of year. That's why I liked it. I'd been working as a park ranger for about eight years now, mainly out here in the thick woods of the Wachita Mountains in Arkansas. The visitors were few and far between, and that suited me just fine. I wasn't one for small talk or chit-chat. The solitude was why I took this job in the first place. My name's Ethan McAllister, and before this gig I spent some rough years working construction in Tulsa. That life wore me down, too many late nights, too many angry bosses, too many beers to chase away the frustration. This job, though, gave me peace, at least until recently. Today started like any other. My shift began at dawn, patrolling the deep forest trails, checking on the campsites to make sure everything was in order. The air was crisp, cool even, and I could feel the dampness of the morning dew clinging to my boots as I made my way down a familiar path the one leading towards a secluded section of the forest known for its thick canopy and lack of visitors. It was an area I enjoyed, remote, quiet, and teeming with life. At least, usually. When I reached the Pine Hollow area, a place where I knew no one had camped in a long while, something felt off. It's hard to explain. The woods were still, almost too still, like the animals had sensed something they didn't like and decided to hightail it out of there. Birds weren't chirping, squirrels weren't scampering. It was like the forest was holding its breath. I shrugged it off at first, but as I got closer to the old fire pit that had been abandoned months back, I noticed something else. The earth around the pit was disturbed. Large, claw-like marks dug deep into the soil as if some massive animal had been tearing at it. But it wasn't just the ground. The trees surrounding the area had deep gouges, long and jagged like something big had tried to climb up or maybe mark its territory. My first thought was a bear, but the claw marks didn't fit. Too deep, too wide, bigger than anything I'd seen in these woods. And I'd seen plenty. I stood there staring at the damage, trying to make sense of it, when I heard a sharp crack from somewhere off to my left. Instinct kicked in, and I reached for the forty-five I kept holstered at my side. I hadn't had to use it often, mostly to scare off the odd animal or idiot who thought the rules didn't apply to them, but something about that sound made me nervous. I crouched low, moving towards the noise, slow and quiet, hoping to catch sight of whatever made the disturbance. The forest was dense here, thick with underbrush and towering pines that blocked out much of the light. My visibility was limited, but as I pushed further in, I caught a glimpse of something. It moved too quickly for me to make out what it was but it was big, maybe six feet tall, if not more, and fast, faster than anything that size should be. My heart pounded in my chest as I followed the movement, every step calculated. It wasn't until I reached a small clearing that I finally saw it. At first, my mind didn't register what I was looking at. The creature stood hunched over near the edge of the clearing, its back towards me. It was covered in thick, coarse fur, but its body was twisted in ways that shouldn't have been possible. 
limbs too long and bent at odd angles. Its head was low, almost canine in shape, but much larger. The way it moved reminded me of a wolf, but not quite. It was something else. I raised my gun, keeping it steady as I watched the thing, hoping it wouldn't notice me. But then it turned. Its face, if you could call it that, was a mix of features that didn't belong together. It had a snout like a boar, but its mouth stretched unnaturally wide, filled with jagged yellow teeth, more akin to a crocodile's than anything you'd find in a mammal. It locked onto me with its gaze, or what I assumed was its gaze. The way it stared sent a cold chill through my body, like it knew me, like it had been expecting me. I don't scare easily, but in that moment I felt an overwhelming urge to run, but I didn't. I stood my ground, my finger hovering over the trigger, waiting for the creature to make its move. And then it did. It lunged, not towards me, but to my right, disappearing into the trees with an unnatural speed that left me frozen in place. I couldn't tell if it was running from me or towards something else. Either way, I knew I had to follow it. I pushed through the thick underbrush, struggling to keep up with the thing, but it was too fast, too agile. Still, I kept going, determined to track it, to figure out what the hell this thing was. That's when I heard the scream. It was human, high-pitched and terrified, coming from somewhere up ahead. My heart skipped a beat, and I bolted in that direction. When I arrived, I found a young couple, probably in their twenties, staring in horror at the body lying on the ground between them. It was their friend, I guessed. His torso had been torn open, ribs broken and exposed, his insides strewn across the forest floor. The guy's face was frozen in an expression of absolute terror. I had seen death before, but this, this was different. The couple spotted me and ran over, pleading for help, saying something about how they'd seen the creature and how it came out of nowhere. I didn't need them to explain. I knew what had done this. I told them to stay behind me, my gun still drawn, as I scanned the area for any sign of the thing. The couple huddled close, eyes wide and filled with fear. It didn't take long for the creature to reappear. It moved through the trees with an eerie silence, like a shadow, its grotesque form blending with the darkness of the forest. But this time it didn't run. It stood there, watching us, waiting for something. My finger twitched on the trigger, but I hesitated. I wasn't sure a bullet would stop it. The creature let out a sound, a deep, rattling noise that echoed through the trees, before charging towards us. I fired one, two, three shots and the thing faltered, stumbling but not stopping. Its body jerked and twisted as if the bullets had only slowed it down, but I knew I had hit it. Then, in a split second, the creature dropped to the ground with a thud, motionless. I approached cautiously, my gun trained on its body, half expecting it to jump back up. But it didn't. It lay there, blood pooling beneath it, its limbs twitching slightly before going still. I stood over the thing for what felt like an eternity, the couple silent behind me. It was dead, and it didn't vanish into thin air, didn't disappear like some figment of my imagination. Its body was real, lying there in the dirt, a twisted, grotesque thing that shouldn't have existed. I called it in, and soon after, my fellow rangers arrived along with a local sheriff. They were as baffled as I was, their faces pale as they stared at the creature. I don't know what it was, but I knew one thing for sure. It wasn't from around here, and it had been killing in these woods for a long time. We just hadn't known it until now. The sheriff took my statement, and the couple was escorted back to safety. As for the body of the creature, it was taken away for further examination, whatever that means. All I know is it's gone now, and the forest is quiet again. I was never much of a talker, so when they made me the head ranger at Dry Lake Preserve, I figured it suited me just fine. I'm Tom Kellum, a guy who'd rather walk through the woods than sit in some office. I took the job because it let me spend my days where I was most comfortable, out in the wild, away from the buzz of people. It also didn't hurt that the park was practically unknown, 
a forgotten chunk of land tucked in the middle of nowhere in the Appalachian foothills. Most people didn't even know it existed. That's how I liked it. There were only two others on staff, Randy, a quiet guy with a knack for fixing things, and Michelle, who handled the paperwork and the occasional visitor. Visitors were rare. The park wasn't exactly a tourist trap. That's what made it odd when Randy told me about the footprints. Found them down by the old creek bed, he said, squinting against the midday sun. They're big. Don't look like any animal I've ever seen. I didn't think much of it at first. Randy wasn't one to exaggerate, but weird prints in the woods usually meant nothing. I told him I'd check it out after lunch. The creek bed was a good three miles into the park, down a winding trail that hadn't seen much use since the state rerouted the main road years ago. By the time I got there, the light was starting to fade, and I had to crouch low to get a good look at the ground. Randy wasn't wrong. The prints were big, about the size of a dinner plate, but they were oddly shaped, kind of like a bear's, but elongated and with a weird spread to the toes, almost like some kind of reptile. I took a few photos with my phone and sent them to a wildlife biologist I knew in Knoxville. He got back to me a couple hours later with a question that put a knot in my gut. What made these? I had no clue. I hiked back to the station as dusk settled in. I didn't mention anything to Michelle. She was already dealing with the quarterly reports and wouldn't appreciate me piling on more stress. But I told Randy to keep an eye out. Later that night, around midnight, I was woken by a strange noise outside my cabin. It wasn't loud, more like a rhythmic thumping. I got out of bed, grabbed my flashlight, and stepped out onto the porch. The woods around the park had this eerie silence about them, the kind that presses in on you and makes you feel watched. Then I saw it. Movement in the trees about fifty yards off. I clicked on the flashlight and caught the briefest glimpse of something. Something big. It moved with the speed of a wolf, but had a bulk that reminded me of a large cat, though its body was all wrong. My flashlight didn't stay on it long enough for a clear picture, but my first thought was a giant boar, only it was too sleek, too silent for a boar. The next day, Randy told me a couple of the park's fence posts had been knocked down overnight. It didn't sit right with me, but I shrugged it off. The park had a few wild animals, deer mostly, and occasionally we'd get a black bear or a wandering cougar. Maybe that's all it was. Things got weirder when a hiker went missing two days later. He'd been part of a small group from some outdoor adventure club. They'd come up from Atlanta, looking to get off the beaten path. The rest of them returned to the station by nightfall, but one guy, Ralph was his name, never showed up. We organized a search party the next morning, Michelle stayed back to coordinate with the local authorities while Randy and I took a couple volunteers into the woods. We found Ralph's backpack near the creek bed, the same place where Randy had found the tracks. But Ralph wasn't anywhere nearby. I started to get that sinking feeling in my gut again, but there was no time for doubts. We had to keep moving. Around noon, we split up. Randy took one volunteer down the creek while I and another guy named Carl headed uphill toward the ridge. The woods were quiet. Too quiet. You get used to certain sounds when you've been in the woods as long as I have. Birds, squirrels, the rustling of leaves. But there was nothing. Just dead air and the crunch of our boots on the ground. Then we found Ralph. Or what was left of him. He'd been mauled. Badly. His body was twisted in a way that no human body should ever be. But it wasn't just the violence of the attack that bothered me. It was the sheer size of the bites and claw marks on him. No bear or mountain lion could have done that. This was something bigger. Stronger. We radioed back to Michelle, and the authorities were called in. But by the time they arrived, Randy and I had done the bulk of the grim work, collecting what little evidence there was and wrapping Ralph's remains. The sheriff... A grizzled old man who'd seen his share of strange things shook his head as he looked over the scene. This isn't right, he said. Whatever did this, it's not normal. That night, Randy and I sat on the cabin porch, staring into the woods. Neither of us said much, 
but I could tell by the look in his eyes that he was thinking the same thing I was. Something was out there, something that didn't belong in these woods. Then it happened again. Michelle had stayed late at the station to finish up some paperwork. Randy and I were just about to head inside when we heard a blood-curdling scream from the direction of the office. We bolted across the clearing, our flashlights bouncing wildly, the beam cutting through the dark like knives. We found her slumped against the door of the station, claw marks raked across her side. She was still breathing, but barely. I called for an ambulance while Randy tried to stanch the bleeding. She was in shock, mumbling something about eyes in the trees and something fast, too fast for her to see. The paramedics arrived just in time to save her, but the fear in her eyes stuck with me. I had enough. I didn't care what it was anymore. I just knew I needed to stop it. Randy and I grabbed the rifles from the supply shed and set off into the woods, back to that damned creek bed where everything seemed to go wrong. We didn't talk much, just kept our eyes peeled and our weapons ready. It wasn't long before we heard it again, those soft, thudding footsteps, like something heavy moving quickly but with precision. We crept closer, flashlights off, trying to get the jump on it. And then I saw it. It was crouched by the water, hunched over something, probably another animal it had taken down. It looked like a cross between a panther and a crocodile, sleek black fur but with thick scaly patches running down its back. Its limbs were long and muscular, built for speed, but its head... God, that head. It had a snout like an alligator, but smaller, more compact. I don't remember raising the rifle. I just remember pulling the trigger. The creature jerked back, letting out this low, gurgling sound, and then it charged at us, faster than anything I'd ever seen. Randy fired too, but it didn't stop. We kept shooting until it finally collapsed, crashing into the creek with a splash. For a long moment, we just stood there, breathing heavily, staring at the thing we'd just killed. It was real. It was dead. And it was huge. We left it there in the creek, water lapping at its scaly hide, knowing that the authorities would have no choice but to believe us this time. Randy and I walked back to the station in silence. The woods were quiet again, but this time, it felt peaceful. The thing was dead, and Michelle would survive. There was nothing left to say. It was quiet at Eagle Rock Reserve, the kind of stillness that felt like nature's own version of a long exhale. You could hear every rustle of the leaves, every snap of a twig underfoot. This place wasn't popular. It wasn't Yellowstone or Yosemite. It was a small, mostly forgotten state park in northern Minnesota, a place where time seemed to stretch, pull, and eventually knot itself up in odd ways. A perfect hideaway for those who sought solitude or, like me, had nowhere else to be. My name's Marty Canwell, and I've been a park ranger here for about seven years. After my divorce and a string of bad decisions, this was my way of resetting. Turns out it's easier to keep an eye on nature than on people. I had the early shift that day. My partner Roy was supposed to meet me for the afternoon rounds, but Roy was late again. He always was, and frankly, I didn't mind the solo patrol. The main duty was to check the farthest point of the reserve, Eagle's Roost, where some rare birds had been nesting. The trail there cut through the deepest parts of the forest, old growth so thick that, even in broad daylight, shadows clung to the trees like stubborn fog. As I hiked the trail, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The birds weren't singing as they normally did, and the squirrels seemed unusually quiet. The air felt heavy, thick with a humidity that made the hair on my arms prickle. I chalked it up to the weather, or maybe just my imagination. I was wrong. I came to the clearing at Eagle's Roost, a rocky outcrop that overlooked the forest. As I approached, I spotted something odd on the ground, a pair of shoes, child-sized shoes abandoned in the dirt. My stomach tightened. Eagle Rock wasn't the kind of place where kids wandered alone. We rarely saw anyone under the age of 30, and certainly not without supervision. 
I radioed Roy. No answer. Typical. The woods around me were silent, too silent, and something in the pit of my stomach started to twist. I called out, Hello? Anyone out here? My voice sounded too loud, intrusive even. There was no response. But then I heard it, a sound like a branch breaking, except more deliberate, like bones snapping under pressure. It came from the thicket just ahead. I edged closer, my hand on the handle of the pistol holstered at my side. I wasn't armed often, but after a wild boar incident last summer, I didn't take chances out here. I parted the branches, revealing a small, open space beneath the canopy. My breath caught in my throat. There, on the ground, was the body of a deer, or what was left of it. Its limbs were twisted at unnatural angles, bones jutting out of shredded flesh. Its face was frozen in what could only be described as terror. Something had gutted it, but it wasn't a predator. Predators killed to eat. This was different. This was... Savage. Senseless. I backed away slowly, scanning the tree line. My pulse pounded in my ears as I tried Roy again on the radio, my voice steadier than I felt. Still no answer. Then I saw movement. Just a flash of something low to the ground, darting between the trees. Whatever it was, it moved fast. Too fast for a bear, too big for a coyote. My breath quickened. I pulled my pistol free and kept it low, stepping carefully backward. That's when I heard a faint whimper, like a child crying. My heart stopped. I turned toward the sound, following it deeper into the woods. The trees became thicker, the shadows longer, and that eerie silence returned. I couldn't place it, but the forest felt wrong. And then I saw her, a little girl, no older than eight, standing alone in the middle of the clearing, barefoot and dressed in a pale, dirt-streaked nightgown. Her dark hair hung limp over her face. She was crying softly, her shoulders shaking with each sob. Hey, I said gently, holstering my gun and approaching her cautiously. Hey, sweetheart, are you lost? She didn't respond. As I drew closer, something clicked in the back of my mind. Something that wasn't right about her, the way she stood too still, too rigid. I stopped a few feet away, and as I crouched down to get a better look, she slowly raised her head. Her eyes were wrong. They weren't the eyes of a frightened child. They were black, endless, like two pits of nothingness. I stumbled backward, nearly tripping over a root. The girl's mouth twitched into a crooked, unnatural smile. And then she screamed. It was a high-pitched, bone-rattling wail that didn't belong to a human, let alone a child. I scrambled back to my feet, the noise ringing in my ears, but before I could react, something massive shot out from the trees behind her. A shape, long and sinewy, like the body of a snake, but covered in thick, matted fur. It slithered forward with impossible speed, its mouth opening wide, revealing rows of sharp teeth like that of a lamprey. I didn't think. I just ran. The forest around me became a blur of dark green and brown as I sprinted back toward the trail. The sound of something crashing through the underbrush followed close behind, too close. I turned and fired blindly over my shoulder. I heard a screech, but I didn't stop to see if I had hit anything. My only goal was to reach the ranger station. My lungs burned by the time I broke through the tree line and spotted the small wooden station in the distance. I could still hear that thing behind me, tearing through the forest with a speed that made my stomach churn. I burst through the door of the station, slamming it shut behind me and locking it. I pressed my back against the wall, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I fumbled for the radio on the desk, my hands shaking. Roy! I shouted into the receiver. Roy! Where the hell are you? Static crackled, followed by a voice. Marty, calm down. What's going on? Before I could respond, something slammed against the door, hard enough to rattle the frame. The creature outside let out a low, guttural sound, like the pained bellow of a wounded animal. Something's out there, I whispered into the radio. Something's hunting me. Roy's voice came through, confused and anxious. Stay put. I'm on my way. 
The door creaked, the wood splintering under pressure. I drew my pistol again, my palms slick with sweat. The noise stopped for a moment, and I thought maybe it had left. Maybe it realized I wasn't worth the effort. But then, from one of the back windows, I saw it. Its head, snake-like but with that matted fur peering in. It opened its mouth wide again, revealing those horrific lamprey teeth. It let out a screech, and I fired without thinking. The bullet hit its mark. The creature thrashed wildly, its head whipping back and forth before collapsing onto the ground just outside the window. I didn't wait to check if it was dead. I knew better. Roy showed up an hour later, just as I was reloading my pistol. He didn't say a word when he saw the mess outside the window, just stared, slack-jawed. They won't believe us, he muttered after a long silence. They don't have to, I replied, glancing at the body. But that thing... It's not going anywhere. And it didn't. I had been a park ranger in Mooney's flat for about five years. Ever since, I decided to leave behind the stress of city life and find some peace in the woods. My friends thought I was nuts for trading in a cushy marketing job for a cabin in the woods, but I'd had my fill of corporate nonsense and smog-filled streets. I wanted something real, something that didn't involve staring at a screen all day. The irony is the woods weren't as peaceful as I thought they'd be. Mooney's Flat isn't a place you'd see on postcards. Tucked away in a quiet, wooded corner of Oregon, it's known only by the few locals and the occasional lost tourist. Our ranger station sits on the edge of a vast, uninhabited stretch of forest, peppered with thick trees and the kind of underbrush that can swallow you whole if you're not careful. We don't get a lot of visitors, but when we do, they're usually the hiking or camping type, the ones looking to escape from life just like I was. One night, around 10 p.m., I was still at the ranger station wrapping up paperwork for an overdue permit. I was alone, as usual, the other rangers already clocked out for the day. I didn't mind the quiet. The hum of the coffee maker and the soft tap of the rain against the window were the only sounds keeping me company. Just as I was about to call it a night, the radio crackled to life with static. Then a faint voice came through. Ranger. Emergency. Campsite. Something's wrong. It was hard to make out all the words, but I recognized the voice. It was Patrick Morgan, a local who liked to camp out in the deeper parts of the forest, away from the usual trails. Patrick was a seasoned outdoorsman, the type who could identify animal tracks with a glance and make fire with two sticks and some leaves. So, when he said something was wrong, I knew it had to be serious. I grabbed my coat and flashlight, hopped in the ranger jeep, and sped down the narrow dirt roads leading to his favorite campsite. It wasn't far maybe a 20-minute drive from the station. The rain had picked up, making visibility tough, but I'd driven these roads so many times that I could navigate them with my eyes closed. When I got there, Patrick's tent was still pitched, but it was shredded in places like something had clawed at it. His truck was nearby, doors open, headlights dimmed by the rain. I called out his name a couple of times, but only the wind answered. That, and something else a low, almost whining noise coming from the trees. It reminded me of the way a large dog sounds when it's hurt, but it was too guttural for that, too unnatural. I shined my flashlight toward the trees, and that's when I saw Patrick, or what was left of him. His body was half hidden by the underbrush, and his face was frozen in a contorted mask of fear. His arms and legs had been torn apart, like he'd been dragged into the woods by something far stronger than any human. The air was thick with the metallic scent of blood, and I could see patches of skin missing from his body as if something had gnawed on him. I swallowed hard and stumbled back toward the jeep, fumbling with the radio. Dispatch, this is Ranger Dane. We've got a... We've got a situation. Morgan's dead. Something's out here. The reply was delayed, garbled by static. Repeat, Dane. What do you mean, something? But I didn't have time to explain because I heard it again, that whining, almost mechanical sound. 
but this time, it was closer. I turned around and spotted movement in the trees, something large shifting between the branches. I aimed the flashlight, and for a brief moment, I saw it. A creature about the size of a bull, but leaner, with long, sinewy limbs. Its fur was patchy and matted, almost like the wet feathers of a bird. But it moved with an eerie grace, its back arched, and its head hunched low. I couldn't see its face clearly, but what little I did glimpse reminded me of a cross between a wolf and a reptile. Its snout was elongated, but instead of fur or scales, it looked like its skin was stretched too tight over bone. What stood out most was its long, thin neck and the way it swayed as it moved, almost like a cobra sizing up its prey. I wasn't armed. The station's budget was tight, and I had to leave the rifle in for maintenance. Stupid mistake. I grabbed the only thing I had, a flare gun, and took aim. The creature hesitated for a moment, its head tilting as if trying to understand what I was. Then, with a twitch of its body, it sprinted toward me. I didn't think. I fired. The flare shot out with a hiss, lighting up the woods in a fiery red glow. The creature let out a sharp, almost shrieking noise and skittered back into the darkness. But it didn't leave. I could hear it circling the clearing, staying just beyond the reach of my flashlight. I kept the beam trained on the trees, backing slowly toward the jeep. My heart pounded in my chest, and all I could think was that I needed to get out of there before it decided to make another move. As I climbed into the driver's seat, I heard the creature again, that unnatural whining sound, but this time it was distant, retreating deeper into the forest. I sped back to the station, not stopping until I was inside with the door locked behind me. I radioed dispatch again, more clearly this time, telling them everything I'd seen. They were skeptical at first, but when I insisted on getting a search team out there, they finally relented. It took the better part of the night, but when the team arrived at Patrick's campsite, they found what I'd described, his body torn apart, the tent slashed to ribbons. But more disturbing were the claw marks etched into the trees around the campsite, deep and wide, like something had used the trunks as scratching posts. The next morning, the sheriff and the state wildlife officials came out to investigate. They tried to chalk it up to a mountain lion, maybe even a bear, but no one could explain the claw marks or the strange whining sound I'd described. The search for the creature turned up nothing, and eventually they wrote it off as a freak accident, a predator getting too bold in its territory. But I know what I saw. That thing wasn't a bear, and it sure as hell wasn't a mountain lion. It was something else. Something I can't even begin to categorize. And the worst part is, it's still out there, somewhere in those woods, waiting. I took a few days off after that, but eventually I went back to work. Life in the woods doesn't stop just because of one strange encounter. People still come to Mooney's flat to camp and hike, and it's my job to make sure they're safe. But now, every time I hear a strange noise in the trees, I think of Patrick, and I keep my hand close to the rifle. This morning, the sheriff came by the station to check in, asking if I'd heard anything new about the incident. I told him no, but that wasn't entirely true. Last night, while I was closing up the station, I heard it again, that whining sound, just outside the tree line. I didn't go out to investigate, not yet. But something tells me it's not done with us, not by a long shot. And that's where I left it. It started the way most days do for me, with a steaming cup of black coffee in the rickety ranger station, staring out the window at the dense thicket of pines that surrounded Elmwood Reserve. The station was a small, weather-beaten shack nestled on the edge of this sprawling forest, miles from the nearest town. I've worked here for over five years now, and I've always appreciated the quiet. Name's Paul Donner, and for as long as I can remember, I've been the type to gravitate toward solitude. Grew up in a small town in Ohio, nothing special. Got out of there as soon as I could, and after a stint in the military, I found myself as a park ranger. It's a job that lets me stay out of people's way, which suits me just fine. Elmwood is no national treasure like Yellowstone or Yosemite. It's quiet, rarely sees visitors, and most of the wildlife here is your standard fare. Deer, rabbits, the occasional black bear, 
though I haven't spotted one in years. It's the kind of place that gets forgotten easily. Even most of the locals tend to keep their distance, save for the few hunters who make use of the place during season. This time of year, the reserve was especially deserted, and that's when things get strange. It was around mid-afternoon when I got the call. The radio buzzed to life with the voice of Brent, one of the only other rangers stationed here with me. Paul, you hear about that missing couple? His voice crackled with static. Missing couple? News to me, I replied, setting my coffee down. They were supposed to check in at the ranger station down south two days ago, but never did. Sheriff's been getting calls from the family. Any idea where they were headed? Yeah, somewhere near Bitter Falls. You know that part of the reserve? I knew it well. Bitter Falls wasn't exactly a popular spot. It was deep in the woods, about a three-hour hike from the nearest trailhead, and the path to get there was overgrown, almost forgotten. But something about it always felt... off. Locals told stories about it, about people going missing or animals acting strange around there. I'd never seen anything out of the ordinary myself, but I tended to steer clear of the area whenever I could. I'll check it out, I told Brent, already grabbing my pack. But if this is another case of hikers getting lost, they're in for a cold night. Thanks, Paul. Be careful out there. The hike out to Bitter Falls was uneventful at first. The woods were dense and silent, save for the occasional rustling of leaves or chirping of birds. But the further I got, the heavier the air seemed to become. The trees here were taller, older, and there was a strange stillness to the place that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It wasn't until I was less than a mile from the falls that I noticed something strange. Broken branches littered the ground, more than just the usual deadfall, and there were large tracks pressed into the earth. I knelt down to examine them closer. They looked... odd. Too big to be a bear, too wide to be a deer. Almost like a large, powerful canine. Maybe a wolf? But there hadn't been wolves in these parts for decades. My gut told me something wasn't right, but I pushed forward. When I reached the falls, the sound of rushing water filled the air. The sight would have been peaceful if it weren't for what I found near the edge of the clearing. A tent, collapsed and torn to shreds. Nearby, the remnants of a campfire, half-burnt logs scattered across the ground. And blood. A lot of blood. I pulled out my radio. Brent, you there? Static. No response. Brent, do you copy? I repeated, but still nothing. That's when I noticed the second set of tracks, leading away from the campsite, deeper into the woods. These were fresher, and they were accompanied by drag marks in the dirt. Something had been pulled away from here, something heavy. The blood trail led me deeper into the forest. I followed it, my hand instinctively reaching for the rifle strapped to my back. I hadn't used it in years, but something told me I'd need it today. About thirty minutes in, I found what had made the tracks. It was hunched over a pile of broken branches, gnawing at something I couldn't make out at first. The thing was enormous, easily the size of a grizzly, but it was no bear. Its body was covered in matted fur, thick and dark like an elk's, but its legs were long and sinewy, almost like a greyhound's, though far more muscular. It had this humped back, kind of like a hyena, and I could see the powerful muscles ripple underneath its skin as it tore into whatever it was feeding on. Then it lifted its head, and I froze. Its face was wrong, a twisted blend of animal and something else. It had a long, wolf-like snout, but its jaw was wide, wider than any animal I'd ever seen, lined with jagged, yellowed teeth that looked like they belonged to a predator from some other era. Its ears twitched as it sniffed the air, and then it turned to me. Its mouth, smeared with dark red, opened slightly, and I realized it wasn't meat it had been gnawing on. It was bone. I don't know how long I stood there, rifle half-raised, eyes locked on this... thing. But when it took a step toward me, I fired. The shot rang out, echoing through the forest. I watched as the bullet struck the creature in the shoulder. It let out a sound I'd never heard before, 
part snarl, part roar, and part something that didn't belong in this world. But it didn't drop. Instead, it turned and bounded away into the trees, moving faster than anything that size should be able to. I took off after it, but by the time I reached the tree line, it was gone. What it left behind, though, was unmistakable. Bones. Human bones. Cleaned, gnawed, and scattered across the forest floor. I radioed Brent again, this time with an urgency I'd never felt before. Brent, it's Paul. We've got a situation out here. I found them. Or what's left of them. There was a pause before Brent responded, his voice low. Are you sure? Positive. And there's something else out here, something that... I stopped. I didn't know how to explain it. How do you describe a creature that shouldn't exist? Just get the sheriff. We need backup. I waited there until Brent and the sheriff arrived, staying as close to the bones as I could without disturbing them. When they finally showed up, their faces said it all. There was no denying what had happened here. They didn't question me when I pointed out the tracks. The ones too big to be a wolf. Too strange to be a bear. We followed the tracks for a while, but eventually they just... stopped. Vanished. The creature had disappeared into the wilderness like it had never been there at all. But the bones? They were still there. The sheriff called it in, and soon after a team was out here combing the woods. They didn't find the creature, of course, but they couldn't explain the tracks or the bones, either. They didn't need to. I knew what I saw, and they believed me. As for Bitter Falls, they've closed that part of the reserve for now, citing safety concerns due to the incident. I haven't been back there since. When I got back to the station, I sat down at my desk my hands still shaking slightly. I reached for the coffee I'd left there, stone cold by now, and took a sip. The first time I ever heard the name Trapper's Gulch, I was sitting in my tiny kitchen eating breakfast at 5 o'clock a.m. before heading out to work. It sounded like the kind of place that you'd expect to have a few dusty trails, maybe a dilapidated cabin, and some old ghost stories passed around by locals. But in reality, it was just a small patch of forgotten wilderness tucked away between the craggy peaks of the Klamath Mountains. Nothing extraordinary, nothing that would stand out on a map. Except that day, it did. My name's Quinn Barnes. I've been a park ranger for over ten years, and I like to think I've seen my fair share of oddities and disasters. But Trapper's Gulch, well, this place was different. I first got wind of it from a couple of campers who'd shown up at the ranger station looking pale and shaken. They claimed to have heard something deep in the woods, something that wasn't quite right. Now I've had people come in with all sorts of stories, mysterious lights, bizarre howls in the distance. But these two were different. They had that wide-eyed, jittery look of people who've seen something they just can't explain. I brushed it off as exhaustion or a bit of overactive imagination. Besides, the gulch wasn't exactly prime hiking territory, so I figured whatever they heard, it was probably some animal they weren't familiar with. Later that morning, I headed out to check the trails, part of the usual routine. The air was crisp, with that faint smell of pine, and the only sounds were the usual. The distant rustle of leaves, the chirp of birds. I was relaxed even though the story from the campers lingered in the back of my mind. It was one of those places that make you feel completely alone, even though you know civilization isn't all that far away. Trapper's Gulch is isolated, though. Miles of old-growth forest and steep hills with almost no one around for days. The land's practically abandoned except for the occasional backpacker who likes to test their survival skills. I didn't expect to run into anyone out there, but as soon as I reached the gulch... I noticed something odd. The area was disturbingly quiet. No birds, no rustling branches, just silence. It wasn't the peaceful kind of silence either. It felt like the forest was holding its breath. I pushed on, keeping an eye on the ground for tracks or signs of wildlife. That's when I saw it, 
a patch of grass that had been flattened. Whatever had done it wasn't small. This was no deer or elk. It looked like something large had rolled or crawled through, leaving a heavy imprint in the ground. I crouched down to inspect the area, noting the torn foliage and deep gouges in the earth. My first thought was a bear, but something about the tracks seemed... off. There was a pattern that didn't match up with anything I'd seen before, almost like a series of clawed limbs dragged in unison, and the spacing was all wrong. A sound in the distance broke the silence, a soft, rhythmic thud. I froze, every nerve in my body on edge. It wasn't the kind of noise you'd expect to hear in the middle of the woods. It wasn't natural. I looked around, scanning the trees, but saw nothing. Against my better judgment, I started toward the sound, figuring it could be an injured animal or, hell, even a person who'd gotten themselves in a mess. The deeper I went, the stronger the smell became. It was sharp, metallic, like blood and decay. My stomach turned as the thudding grew louder, more deliberate, until I came upon a small clearing. That's when I saw it. At first glance, it looked like a large black mass near a fallen tree. But as I approached, it became clear. The mass was a body, or what was left of one. The limbs were mangled, bones exposed in places where the skin had been ripped away. The sight was horrific, to say the least. I've seen bodies in accidents, but this was different. This was intentional, almost as if the creature had done it out of some kind of primal rage. The corpse, later identified as a hiker named Brandon Wilcox, was torn apart beyond recognition. I stood there for a few moments, completely stunned, trying to make sense of what I was looking at. There were no tracks leading away from the body, but something had clearly dragged it there. And that thudding? It had stopped. Dead silence again. Then came the rustling. Quiet at first, then more persistent. I whipped around, reaching for the radio at my belt when I caught a glimpse of something in the trees. It was large, no doubt about that. But it wasn't moving like anything I'd ever seen. Its gait was uneven, jerking forward and backward with an eerie precision. The closest thing I could compare it to was a gorilla. But it was all wrong. Its body was elongated, misshapen in ways that didn't make sense. Whatever it was, it was staring at me, watching from between the trees. The feeling that washed over me was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. It wasn't fear, not exactly. It was a kind of primal terror, the kind you feel when you know something's watching you from the dark. I fumbled with the radio, trying to get through to dispatch. This is Ranger Barnes. I'm at Trapper's Gulch, and I've got a dead body. I need backup immediately. My voice was shaking, but I managed to get the words out. No response. Just static. I took a few steps back, never taking my eyes off the creature. It didn't move. It just stood there, hunched and breathing heavily. And then, without warning, it lunged. Its movements were quick, almost too quick for something so large. I stumbled backward, narrowly avoiding its claws, and fell to the ground. For a split second, I thought I was done for, that this thing was going to rip me apart like it had with Brandon. But then, just as quickly as it had attacked, it stopped. I scrambled to my feet, backing away slowly. The creature didn't follow. It just stood there, its misshapen head tilted to the side, watching me. I don't know how long I stood there, staring at it. Time seemed to stretch on forever. And then, just as silently as it had appeared, it retreated into the forest, disappearing into the shadows. I didn't waste any time. I turned and ran, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't stop until I reached my truck, and even then I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting that thing to come charging out of the woods after me. Back at the station, I reported the body and the encounter to my supervisor. We brought in the local authorities, and they sent a search party out to Trapper's Gulch. They found Brandon Wilcox's body, or what was left of it. But there was no sign of the creature. No tracks, no blood trail. Nothing. It was as if it had vanished into thin air. Later, 
They tried to chalk it up to a bear attack, but I knew better. What I saw that day wasn't a bear. It wasn't any animal I'd ever encountered before, and I doubt it ever will be again. They closed the case, filed it away as a tragic accident, and that was the end of it. But every now and then, I think back to that clearing in Trapper's Gulch, to the way that creature moved, the way it watched me. And I can't shake the feeling that whatever it was, it's still out there, somewhere, hidden in those woods. But for now, I'll leave it at that. It was supposed to be just another routine day in the park. I've been a ranger here in Catoctin Mountain Park, Maryland, for a little over five years now. The place is remote enough that not many visitors come through, mostly local hikers and occasional tourists who get lost on their way to Camp David. There's something peaceful about working in a park that's more known for being a forgotten corner of the country than a bustling tourist trap. The trees are thick, old, and towering. They stretch their limbs out like they own the land, which I suppose they do, in a way. The air always smells like pine and earth, and the wind brings the occasional distant call of a bird, or the rustle of a squirrel darting through the underbrush. It's quiet most of the time, and I like it that way. My name's Everett Nason, by the way, and I've always liked solitude. Grew up in a small town not far from here, the kind of place that has more churches than people. My dad was a carpenter, and my mom stayed at home, tending the garden and homeschooling my sisters and me. They didn't understand why I left town for the ranger job, but I couldn't stand the thought of staying in one place my whole life. They always thought I'd take over dad's business, work with my hands, and settle down like everyone else. But the park drew me in. There's something about the quiet that makes sense in a way that people never have. That day, like any other, started with a hike along one of the lesser-used trails. I had to check on a reported fallen tree blocking the path about five miles in. Nothing out of the ordinary. Just another day in the woods. By noon, I reached the area. Sure enough, a massive oak had fallen, its roots torn up from the ground like a massive hand had yanked it out of place. I took a few photos for the record, made a note to request a chainsaw from the maintenance crew, and started heading back. That's when I first noticed the smell. It wasn't the usual scent of decomposing leaves or a dead animal caught under brush. This was... rancid like rotten meat left in the sun for too long. I've smelled decaying carcasses before, and this was worse. I paused, looking around trying to pinpoint where it was coming from. But the forest was still, unnervingly so. Even the birds seemed to have gone silent. I pushed forward, hoping it was just an old deer that had wandered too far off the beaten path, but the smell grew stronger with every step. My hand instinctively dropped to the knife strapped to my belt, more for comfort than anything else. Then I heard it, a rustling in the brush, quick and heavy. At first I thought it might be a bear. There have been sightings around here, though rare. But this was different. The sound was too deliberate, too calculated. It wasn't the clumsy movements of an animal unsure of its surroundings. I crouched down, peering through the thick foliage, and that's when I saw something moving about twenty yards ahead. It was low to the ground, almost as if it was crawling, but it was massive, easily the size of a large wolf. Its limbs were too long, though, like they were stretched unnaturally. For a moment, I considered the possibility that it was some kind of deformed animal. Maybe a diseased wolf or coyote, though it was too large for a coyote. I kept low, trying to get a better look, but the thing moved again quicker this time, disappearing behind a cluster of trees. I stood up slowly, my pulse quickening. Whatever it was, I didn't want to get closer without some backup. I grabbed my radio and tried to call in, but all I got was static. I wasn't surprised. This part of the park always had terrible reception, but it didn't make me feel any better. I debated whether to follow the thing or head back to the main office, but the curiosity got the better of me. I've never been one to leave something unsolved, and this thing, whatever it was, was definitely something I'd never seen before. As I made my way toward where I last saw it, the stench hit me again, even stronger this time. 
my eyes started to water from the intensity of it. I stumbled forward, covering my nose with the sleeve of my jacket, and that's when I saw the first body. It was a man, though barely recognizable. His limbs were twisted at unnatural angles, his skin pale and taut like it had been drained of blood. The worst part was his face, or what was left of it. Deep gouges ran across his skull as if something with sharp claws had torn into him. His eyes were wide open, frozen in terror. The ground beneath him was stained dark with dried blood. I gagged, stumbling back, but there was more. A few yards away, another body, a woman this time, lay sprawled on the forest floor, her torso ripped open, ribs exposed. Her entrails were scattered around her like someone had tossed them aside without care. I wanted to throw up, to run, to call for help, but the sound of movement behind me froze me in place. I spun around, knife in hand, and there it was. The creature stepped out from behind a large oak, and my brain struggled to make sense of what I was seeing. It was like a nightmare stitched together from pieces of animals that didn't belong together. Its body was long and sinewy, covered in patches of dark, matted fur. Its legs were bent like a wolf's, but its arms, if you could call them that, were too long, ending in what looked like jagged claws. It reminded me of a sloth in some ways, with limbs too long for its body, but this thing was far more menacing. Its face was the worst part. It had the elongated snout of a canine, but its mouth was filled with rows of mismatched, uneven teeth, some jagged like a shark's, others blunt like a herbivore's. The skin around its mouth was pulled back, exposing too much gum and giving it a permanent snarl. I backed away slowly, my heart pounding in my chest, but the thing didn't move. It just watched me, head cocked to the side as if it were studying me. Then it stepped forward, and that was all the motivation I needed. I turned and bolted through the trees, my legs burning as I raced back toward the main trail. The sound of snapping branches and heavy footsteps followed close behind. I could hear it gaining on me, that awful stench filling my lungs. I knew I wouldn't make it back to the office before it caught me. My only hope was the ranger station a mile or so up the trail. If I could just get inside, maybe I could barricade the door and call for help. But just as the station came into view, I felt something heavy slam into me from behind. I hit the ground hard, the wind knocked out of me. I rolled onto my back and the creature was there, looming over me, its breath hot and rancid on my face. Without thinking, I lashed out with my knife, catching it in the side. It let out a sound that was more like a hiss than a roar, and for a moment I thought I might have a chance. But then it swiped at me with one of its claws, and pain exploded in my side as its talons tore through my jacket and into my flesh. I screamed, kicking out with my legs, trying to push it off, but it was too strong. It pinned me to the ground, its mouth opening wide, too wide, as if it was about to bite down. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it stopped. Its head jerked to the side, and it released me, retreating into the woods as quickly as it had come. I lay there, gasping for air, clutching my bleeding side, watching as the creature disappeared into the trees. I waited for what felt like hours before I dared to move. When I finally made it to the station, I collapsed inside, locking the door behind me. Later, when the other rangers arrived, they found the bodies. They believed me. How could they not with the carnage laid out in front of them? But no one knew what the creature was. They never found it, though the smell lingered in the air for days like a warning. I still work here, still patrol the same trails. But every time I catch a whiff of something off, I can't help but wonder if it's still out there.